Hi, so welcome to today's Football Collective Zoom session. It's the third in our programme. The date's the 6th of May 2020, and it probably feels like a long time since football was at least suspended, if not cancelled for the season. My name's Peter Millward, and I'll be chairing today's debate, which centralises the issue around supporter representation, and it's titled Discussing Football Fan Engagement Projects, Action, Participation and Club Ownership Debates. Accordingly, on today's panel, we have experts from football supporter associations within and beyond the UK. The structure for today is we'll do 30 minutes of question and discussion prompted by me as the chair, then questions invited from the virtual floor. We'll look to end these about 3.45 to move into the wrap up phase, so we'll be finished about 10 to 4. So in saying all that, there's a key point that we may not be able to address all issues today, but opening up debates around roles and representation of supporters in football can become a key plank in the football collective sessions over the summer. If you want to offer your services as a guest or host for one of these sessions, the football collective would really welcome that. You can do that in the comment box down the left of the screen, or you can contact any of us via direct message on Twitter. So without further ado, if I hand over to the panelists to, interview, to introduce themselves one by one, if we go with Ronan first. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I'm Ronan. I'm the executive director of Football Supporters Europe, uh, currently on lockdown in uh, South Brittany, France. Excellent. And we hand to Richard next. Hi, I'm Richard Irving. I am the network manager for community owned clubs at the Football Supporters Association. And for those of you that may have seen me at uh, football collective events previously, conferences and the like, uh, I'm also a PhD student uh, studying supporter ownership at uh, Birkbeck, the University of London. Excellent. Over to Nicola. Hi, I'm Nicola Cave. I'm the constitutional expert at the FSA. I specialise in the registration of supporters trusts as community benefit societies and the subsequent training of those trusts for correct operation. I also take the lead in the collation and production of all of our training materials. So I'm the resident geek. Brilliant. Brilliant. We, we like geeks, some of us here identify as that. So uh, as we go further, would you, be able to, um, would you be able to tell those that are listening about the background of your organizations, maybe the history of it, recent changes, and maybe current campaigns? So if we stick with the FSA first. Nick, do you want to do that bit? Yeah, uh, obviously the FSA is a, a new organization. Uh, it has come about um, due to the merger of Supporters Direct. Uh, and the FSF. Um, we've been going for just over a year in this format. Um, we are the National Democratic Representative Body for football supporters in England and Wales. Um, we're the leading advocates for supporter ownership, fan engagement, and we head up campaigns such as looking at cheaper ticket prices, safe standing, um, do a lot of work to protect fan rights, uh, we champion good governance and promote diversity and all types of supporter empowerment in the game. Excellent. Richard, anything to add? Um, no, I think that encapsulated it perfectly, actually. Uh, but now over to Renan. Thanks. Um, so we are the Euro European equivalent of the FSA, uh, which is uh, in the form of the of one of its predecessors. The FSF was one of our founding members, exists since 2008. We work on the same topic, so I don't need to go through through that. Uh, as for what we're currently doing, obviously we are as uh, as the FSA and the other national fan organization. We're in a bit in a weird times. We are. The, the biggest challenge for us at the moment is the postponing of the Euro and all of our activities related to it. And um, yeah, the new activity for us has been to, to list and try to highlight the activities of the fan organizations over Europe in terms of uh, fundraising, solidarity activities, help to vulnerable groups, etc. in relation with the COVID-19 crisis. Right. So could I just ask, Ranan, what type of activities would FSC have engaged with at the Euros? Well, we coordinate the work of the fans embassies, which is um, which consists of two things: is advising the organisers of the tournaments, the public authorities, uh, UEFA, in the run-up of the tournament to try to 
as much as possible, ensure that the the the, the, the needs and needs and expectations of the of the national team fans are taken into consideration during those tournaments, and then during the tournament itself, facilitate the relation between fan organization, fan representative, and the tournament organizers, and organize um, inf um, channels of information and information point in the host cities that are run by fans of the of the national team. So in the case of the FSA, for example, that would mean a group of volunteers and staff of the FSA traveling to the host cities where England is playing and and run an info point where English fans can come and get information, can receive support if they've been in, in any sort of trouble. And those people also liaising with the public authorities and the uh, match organizers in the host cities. Obviously, so there would, the, would have been new challenges had yeah, Europe yeah, was yeah. place this summer with it being a multi-site year. It was already quite challenging. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, it was already quite a challenge. And now the tournament is pushed for one year and there's a lot of, I mean, like a lot of clarity on where the tournament will be played exactly because some of the host cities and host countries are not so keen to hosting it anymore. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, a lot of question marks there. And different national approaches may lead to some nations being judged to be more safe than others, I guess. Yeah, 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 exactly. And I mean, it's understandable that there are two situations. There are countries like Italy that have all these things to deal with at the moment. And uh, Amsterdam host city, host city, which has already planned concerts and whatever in the stadiums for, ne for next year. So they're not so keen on uh, hosting the competition. So I guess there's a fair chance that uh, uh, big numbers of games end up in, in Wembley and in other UK venues. Mm. Which is which presents a new in, new issue given that the UK is, has the highest number of COVID deaths so far across yeah. Europe. Yeah. If we can move across yeah. to the FSA, um, I was recently taken by a new development in the FSA around the Women's Supporter Network. I wonder if either uh, Nicola or Richard would like to talk to that a little. Yeah, um, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll address that one. Just uh, moving on from what uh, Renan was saying about um, fan embassies, um, for example, one of the things that we've done um, at the Women's World Cup last year in France was um, hosting fan embassies um, um, under our, our guise of free, not, free, free lionesses. Um, yeah. Went really well across uh, seven cities, six games, um, had about 1,200 people turn up at um, the... Uh, embassy throughout the duration of the, uh, the tournament. So that was a kind of new development that uh, um, one of our colleagues, Debs, has been working on. Um, at the moment, um, or, or prior to uh, the sort of COVID lock lockdown, we've been growing the network of um, member supporter clubs um, for the women's game um, and building up some dialogue with the representatives of the women's game within the FA. Um, right at this moment, following lockdown, we're, we're kind of working on how we can develop that, um, trying to survey um, some of the uh, the supporter groups to see what their thoughts are about where the uh, the ending of the season goes from here, what sort of questions they want to ask of the FA and those sorts of things. And um, generally supporting those support groups around um, the raising of money, because obviously there's going to be pressure on the uh, the game, right the, I mean, right the way across the game. Uh, the women's game isn't alone, obviously, but... Um, Certainly different challenges, I think, as far as the women's game is concerned, uh, particularly in the light of what you see um, with AFC Fylde, for example, in the past week or so, um, looking to abandon their, uh, their, their women's uh, team, which is a really, really unfortunate uh, development, uh, I'm afraid. Is there anything we can do to change that situation? <sighs> that, that one in, in particular, or uh, just, just... As a general approach? A, a general approach, I guess, is to um, all all of the time our clubs are, uh, or when when things change. I mean, a lot a lot of clubs are in in a sort of hibernation um, type phase right at this moment. But I think once things start to move out of lockdown, it's about uh, volunteering, getting involved yourselves at your your local clubs, and um, and that that goes for you know right the way across the game. I think you know there's going to be that need. We, we've surveyed members uh, to see whether they're um, you know, mem member clubs to see whether their feeling is that they will lose volunteers, and that's one area where they're hopeful that they'll they'll hold up. Whereas sponsorship and those sorts of things will will obviously suffer. But um, there will be um, there'll probably be a, you know a fairly short period of time to get things back up and running. So um, 
yeah, encourage everybody to uh, volunteer for their local club, uh, whatever whatever they can do, because uh, I'm sure they'd be uh, gratefully received. Mm. And this brings us uh, nicely onto the next question, which is, it's an open question to all three panel members, which is that football has been described as more important than life or death, but for others it's just a borderline, irrelevant pastime. What do you think the social value of football is in the current crisis? Who'd like to go first? Yeah, if you don't mind, I can jump in. But Even looking before this crisis, we were great believers that football had a social value far beyond just the 90 minutes on the pitch. And we've actively supported and activated our member fan groups to take the lead on and um, partner with their clubs and encourage their respective clubs to value and assist the communities in which they operate and serve. It's something that we've we've strongly uh, pushed for, for a number of years now. Our fan groups um, come in different shapes and sizes, but I specialise in setting up groups as community benefit societies. So they're entities that are registered with the FCA. It's stated in their rules that they're not that they're inclusive, that they operate one member, one vote, and they exist for the benefit of their respective communities. So in this case, it's the supporters trusts, their communities are the fan base uh, and direct residential communities of the clubs they support. Um, you know, they have aims like strengthening bonds between the club and community um, and providing vehicles for credible structured engagement between fans and the club and the community they serve. So before Corona, there were some amazing examples of, of work that we were doing or our fan groups were doing uh, with their respective communities, like walking football, fitness group, engaging those who've traditionally fallen out of love with exercise and partnershiping with clubs to provide that service. We had the Foxes Trust who worked with De Montford University to pilot schools literacy programmes. Um, you might have seen the food bank collections, fans supporting food banks. Uh, that came from Everton and Liverpool fans coming together for the good of their community to undertake food bank collections on match days and it's grown and it's grown and a number of sports trusts all over the country have taken this up and now they don't just collect food they've expanded to help with provision of legal and financial advice because poverty isn't just those lacking in food it's people lacking in as well um, dementia groups memories groups providing dementia friends at clubs We've got clubs that, and groups that purchase ticket allocations and distribute them to those who would like unable to be attending the games usually. Um, and our groups have worked hard to register those sports grounds as assets of community value, which gives the groups a right to bid and a power to be informed should the owner wish to sell their club's ground. So the, all that was in place before this crisis hit and was a great springboard for those groups to be reactivated in the face of this crisis. And now we've got clubs and our fan groups reaching out to vulnerable fans to provide assistance with shopping, medication, transport, uh, actively engaging with supporters and members of the community that are at risk from mental health deterioration because of lockdown. Your football is traditionally an outlet for, for men and young male suicide rates were already at a high prior to this lockdown. It's important that football does its part to ensure that those who usually use the game as a vehicle for offloading or getting away from those dark thoughts and fears are supported and given an outlet at these times. We've had esports tournaments, um, and Moi arranged a fantastic esports tournament that's just taken place. Mm, I saw that. Yeah, it, and you know, like just and different groups coming together, you know, and, and clubs coming out and providing fans with, with simple, clear cut information, taking that government information and disseminating it in the, in the language of their fans, you know, activity sheets, recipe sheets things that people can do to keep themselves busy and playing all the runs of games, hosting quizzes. We've seen all of that. So yes, you, you, there might be a view that, that you know, football isn't, uh, it isn't a matter of life and death, but it can certainly make the difference to those in our communities when those communities are served properly by the football club and its fans. It, it can be a hub uh, and, a, and a power for good. And I think that's something that these times have really emphasized the power of good that football can be. Yeah. How do we, how do we go and follow up that response? Um, um, do you think football, do you think we might expect too much from football clubs at some point? It, but say to me, it's that question. Yeah, yeah. It, how do we it, turn it, and go back? Yeah, I mean, it, it, okay. Um, it's hard to paint them all, kind of to say all football clubs on the same level because you have football clubs that are doing incredible work. Um, 
and like like you look at Tranmere, what they do with their community projects and and you know they they are one of those clubs that they have 500 season tickets every season they distribute to to um community groups to allow yeah. To come to games you know you've got group you've got clubs that do great work in, in engaging with their fans they're open they're transparent they tell you everything Andy Holt Accrington Stanley being a great example so you've got those at the top end that are doing this brilliant job and then you have clubs that that could yes they could be doing more they need to be better engaged they need to care more about their community and it benefits them it's not just you know what business wouldn't want to how you know that sort of input and, and feedback from from their main stakeholders uh, it, it's it, it baffles me why engagement is um such a difficult task with some with some clubs mm. because at the end of the day they will benefit greatly from having those community relations many of these many of the initiatives are bottom up from the fans like fans supporting food banks but i've been um struck with I'm a Wigan Athletic season ticket holder, and um, as is as is my 76 year old dad, he'll kill me for mentioning his age on this. But my 76 year old dad and and the community trust have been from the football club. I've called him up a couple of times just to check he's okay. That's yeah, quite a yeah. cool thing to do. Yeah, That's there's there's been a lot of great examples, and say so at the end of the day, you've got to talk. Sometimes it's all about talking to clubs in their language. You say, you know, your stakeholders are what keeps your club going. Who are your stakeholders? Well, first and foremost, it's the fans. And then it's your local businesses, your local councils, your residents, those community groups. And if you have a great relationship with them and look to support them, they will support you. Yeah. And Ronan, this kind of chimes with some of the stuff I've seen online very recently from FSC. Uh, FSC and supporters direct with its fans versus COVID-19. Uh, could you talk us through that a little? Yeah, the, we are we're hardly the messengers here, but uh, we had the feeling that um, there was a necessity to, to, to list, to keep track of all of, the, of, the, all of that, what is happening. Some, some groups would just be raising a few hundred euros um, to, buy, to buy pizzas for, for medical staff for the first responders. Others have grown to incredible proportions, and especially those that are raising funds for medical staff. Um, so we are, yeah, we felt the need to, to collect those so that there is, there is a trace somewhere that there's been a contribution from the fans to this crisis. And uh, well, when we look at the, 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 the clubs that have, uh, that realize their, their social responsibilities, the, the, the ones that were just mentioned by, by Nicola, that's, um, that, that's one side of the coin, but a lot of other clubs, if we look throughout all, the whole continent, are uh, not, uh, let's say, making, putting a lot of efforts into uh, engaging in, in, in social uh, activities and social responsibility activities at this time of crisis. Um, and uh, very often, if I look at my club, it's not in France. There's a, been a lot more work done by various fan groups than by the club itself. And that's the difficulty of a club that, whose priority is to send money to Luxembourg and Panama and not actually make a difference for the, uh, for the community around the club. So. Um, I think for a lot of fans, the it was it was obvious that they had to do something. The structure is there; it exists, and people had nothing else to do. There's no game. There's no way game. There, so you better use the existing uh, organization to, to 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 do something good out of it. Uh, there was also for some of us, some fans, uh, the way to compensate the fact that the clubs wasn't doing anything in this, uh, in this crisis. And it's been, working, it's been working pretty well. So yeah, the contribution of fans to, the, uh, to this crisis has been, I think, uh, really huge, especially in some Western European countries. So Germany, Italy, France, England, Netherlands. Uh, at least that's where we've been listing most of uh, most of them. Now, when, uh, the question about football being more important than life or death, this argument has been reused by some some politicians, some people in football, the other way around. We've been told in England that it will lift up the spirit of the nation. The same argument has been used in Germany. It's been used by some people in France as well. whose only interest was to, uh, to, to 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 get some cash in. So. Yeah, it's, it's probably more important than life or death for a lot of people. But what we've seen also is that the majority of fans across Europe were very much ready to post football. Mm -hmm. And the statements we've seen from national fan organization in uh, their 
the huge majority of them from Spain, from, from, from Germany, from Portugal, from France. The, 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 on, the only request was to stop football. There was no need to continue football in this time of crisis. And it was a matter of distancy, actually, to stop it, to stop the show. So, yeah, it's a matter of life or death, but uh, uh, it, 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 it's not a matter of life or death to be able to see a football game on TV or to go to the stadium, at least not. It's a really good point. And I think that it's a really good point you raised, Ronan. And I think that quite quickly there was a turnaround in opinion, wasn't there? There was a, there was a quite rapid change to, to, from supporters um, feeling quite resistant to the idea of football matches being shut down to actually then changing that view very quickly kind of within the space of a week as more public information became available. Um, I, w- I wonder if there was, I wonder if FSE had a channel to try to take, to take that forward to UEFA for those leagues. For instance, was it the Belarusian league that, that didn't, that didn't cancel? Yeah, um, yeah that, was, that was the only one in the UEFA region. Um, well, the message we carried to UEFA was that everybody would, we're ready to pause the European competition, so we're actually encouraging them to take a, to take a quick decision because the, mm-hmm. the faster the decision would be taken, the less impact it would have on 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 match going fans. So that was that was our message at that time. But as you say, it was a really quick turnaround. I think it was yeah, it's a matter of days, weeks between the time when PSG fans were outside of the of the stadium uh, in Paris for the games against Dortmund, which by the way was perfectly legal at that time. It was sanctioned by the by the public authorities. And between that day and the one when everybody started to agree that football had to be paused and we need we needed to invest time and resources into supporting medical staff and all the solidarity actions. It was yeah, probably five to seven days between those two uh, events. So uh, I think uh, all all the concerns expressed, especially in England, in UK and in Germany, about fans gathering around the stadium on the days when there will be games behind closed doors. I don't, I, I don't think this is, a, this is a serious risk or this is likely to happen. There's, again, a very strong understanding of what's the social responsibility from a fan group, from the vast majority of us. So they're not going to put people at risk by calling them to, to gather around the stadiums on match day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure. And and this 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 point, I suppose, could be. Um, I'd like Richard to pick this up with, uh, particularly the cancellation of the national league season. Um, um. So so. What what pressures? What competing pressures were placed on the national league to do that? And what logistical problems does that early end of the season present? And did it have to happen? So that's a question to Richard. Yeah. Um. So. I've- I think the taking it back a step um, when steps three to seven were cancelled um, of the of the national game um, right at the very very early stages that was done by the FA. So to talk you through um, kind of, kind of how it came about, um, the FA took the decision. They, to be honest, um, at that point they they said that they consulted widely and, and they quite clearly haven't. Um, and it became pretty obvious though fairly you know, very early on that. Um, the majority of people actually agreed with the decision. We actually surveyed our community-owned clubs. Over 80% of them said that it was actually the correct decision to finish the season, expunge the records, etc. Um, and that's, prim- that's for a number of reasons, about four different reasons that that made, made sense to do that. Um, a- alongside um, the fact that um, the contracts of the players would end at the end of April. Um, these are predominantly small clubs. Um, that um, you know, wouldn't have the money to sort of pay people um, beyond that sort of a stage. If you let it go any longer, there was a chance that if you restarted it, even within a month, um, the teams would have um, changed immeasurably and the squads would be different. Um, certain teams would play their under 18s because of a lack of money. And so the competitive balance would go out of the window. Um, there's all, you know, as, as things have moved on, it's been become clear that it, it was a good decision because there was the need then to prepare for what will be the next season whenever that happens and that obviously could be quite a long way away and obviously there's always a chance that the, the virus could come back as well which would be create all sorts of problems as far as the the national game is concerned well they're, they're still going through the process of negotiation on this and, and they're involving their clubs they're voting on what's happening there um, logistically it's not um, a major issue at this moment because of course we just don't know when things are going to take place. They've got to a stage within the, in steps one and two of the national game in the National League itself. 
um, where they've agreed that they're going to end the season, but they haven't agreed on what basis they're going to do that, and they will move into uh, into playoffs. So um, that's you know it's been a, a consultative process that they've uh, they've gone through, but at the end of the day, I think they probably are going to be led by what happens at the top of the game and what happens um, with the Premier League, the EFL, and what what then sort of drips down into. Uh, into that level as well. They can only make certain numbers of decisions, I think, that are relevant to them. But um, yeah, I mean, it's real challenges um, right away across the board. But as I say, I think the, um, from, from the perspective of what, what has happened so far, I think the right decisions have been made. Um, really, really difficult to know what will happen because it's all going to be led by what the government advice is, basically. So I've just, I said I wouldn't hog the questions and I'll, throw the questions open to the virtual floor at some point very soon. I've, I've just got one final question for each of the panel members, which is looking to the future and what does, what does the post COVID environment look like for your organizations and for your roles in those organizations? So I can see Richard's on the camera now. So can we stick with Richard first of all? Okay. Yeah, I think it really moves on from, from what I said um, previously, the, the new challenges are very much dictated to an extent by what um, what, what happens with the public health situation um, when the start can be of, of football again can be you know, healthily guaranteed um, and the like and, and the, the sorts of instructions that the leagues and the FAs um, you know, or, or the league, leagues across the country and the FA in general um, can 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 really sort of you know get behind when they can actually agree on when things can start. I think as far as the challenges going forward, as far as for, from from my own personal perspective with community owned clubs, um, I think it's a really really good opportunity for a bit of a reset. There's been quite a lot of um, talk over the last few days um, about um, things around salary caps, around lowering of budgets. Um, the more local leagues, I think, you know, the use of more local players, so lower wages, um, for example, um, and you know, the fact that the non-league is very much dependent upon the, the non-league, uh, and, you know, and, and something that not all of our clubs are in the non-league, um, but um, the majority are, um, and that's not going to happen behind closed doors. It's just um, the reality is that non-league clubs rely on people coming through the gate to not only uh, you know just 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 pay that money on the turnstile, but um, to to spend money on food and uh, and drink and the like. So, I think there's there's a massive chance for a reset. I think um, at the end of the day, maybe we might see something whereby at the moment um, the the leagues themselves appear to be won by the team with the highest budget. Maybe we have a bit of a focus on the talents of the managers, the coaches, the players, etc. And it gets back into a, a slightly more balanced um, future set of leagues. Um, I can't speak for what will happen further up the leagues, but I think within the non-league, it might uh, it, it might just that reset might just happen, and it might actually make it um, a little bit more competitive and a bit more even more interesting, perhaps. A freshen up. The yeah. crisis creates an yeah. opportunity for a freshen up. Yeah, I think so you've got to look at positives. Um, you know, there are huge amount. You know, I didn't speak about any of the negatives about those loss of. Uh, the loss of budgets, the potential loss of sponsors, you know, massive changes across clubs, uh, some potentially going to the wall. But, but, you know, I'm trying to accentuate the positives, really, I think. Yeah. And it depends what you mean by a football club, because the supporters will be there. Phoenix yeah. clubs will emerge. We don't want that scenario to, to present itself. But if it does, Phoenix, Phoenix clubs will emerge, presumably yeah. with the support of the FSA. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what we, we would do. I mean, we... Um, we believe that our community-owned clubs, for example, are robust in the way that they're run. Um, we have we surveyed once again, as I mentioned earlier, we surveyed the community-owned clubs. Um, towards seventy percent felt that um, with no football, they were comfortable to operate in the way that they are currently um, until till September and beyond. In 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 that that sort of percentage of, of cases, so we we feel that they're more robust by comparison to, say, clubs in the championship, you know, with where, um, as we all know, um, if we've um, looked at anything to do with football governance over the last few years, um, clubs at uh, the championship level are collectively losing sort of towards three quarters of a billion pounds um, across a, a year, um, which is quite frankly unsustainable in, in anybody's book. So 
Um, you know, it's it, that that reset. I think will be advantageous potentially to um, the, the clubs in in community ownership. Um, I'd like to think that, as you say, we don't lose anybody, but I would worry that um, there are clubs that are particularly vulnerable at this stage. Thank you, Richard. And if we switch to Nicola. Yeah, I mean, it's a very, very fluid situation at the moment. It's changing every day. Um, we've tried very hard as an organisation to avoid speculation. There's a, there's a lot of different ideas of what could happen floating about there. You know, as football fans, obviously, we'd, we'd welcome the game returning, but safely and based on government and health advice, I think is the, is the strongest point I, I could make. Um, from a point of view of my role, though, going forwards, obviously, as, as I said earlier, I focus quite heavily on collating uh, training and resources for our members, um, making sure that those supporter groups can uh, act efficiently, uh, armed with the knowledge for them to be credible vehicles for engagement between their clubs. Um, you know, educated fans are powerful fans, so my role isn't going to change. Um, so in that sense, going forwards, I'm going to be focusing very hard on making sure fans are there, ready, but whatever structure emerges to be at the forefront of engagement and ensure that, that uh, any, whatever structure happens going forwards, we could maybe take advantage of this crisis and ensure that, that there is a better, brighter future for the game that, as Richard says, maybe isn't all about those with the biggest budgets. Thank you, Nicola. And if we switch to Renan? Yeah, I, I think there's, there's a general hope as much as that is possible in uh, in professional football, that, uh, that that the reset might happen. I think I think the crisis made realize a lot of fans that were not engaged in any in any activism how unsustainable uh, football is in most of European countries. When you see major clubs um, begging their fans after just three or four weeks of crisis not to not to claim their money back on their tickets so that they can uh, pay their staff. Uh, because the money has already been spent. I think that's something that the general public might not have realized before, how despite of a, a huge budget and a lot of money circulating around a professional football club, uh, uh, they run like uh, small companies and most of them are, are run in a pretty unsustainable way. So I think a lot of people realize that. And there's bigger expectations now for a different form of football than it was in the past. So I think there is... Their expectations there. Now, when we look at uh, the various situations in Europe, it's it's really different. Uh, in a countries like Germany or France, uh, there's really no impatience to restart. And in any case, football is not go the clubs are not going to disappear. In the worst case scenario, they restart in the fifth, sixth league. It's not the end of the world. We're not in countries where you can you lose your club from one day to another. But on the other hand, most fans would know people working as uh, and in, in the in the in the office, taking play, taking care of the of the grass, this uh, this kind of jobs at the clubs that would be the first one to be fired if the if if the clubs get bankrupt, and uh, I think it's uh, it's a difficult time for most fans to kind of balance those two those two situations and realize what what your claim for different football might mean for um, for people working in that uh, in that industry, but I think. We're ob still observing a lot what is happening. Uh, there's some good, good ideas uh, about this reset uh, floating around. Uh, I think there's also risk that we go for something completely different. Uh, we've seen Gianni Infantino speaking a lot about a different way to do football and pushing for the game to not return so quickly and insisting on the fact that football is not so sustainable. And when you listen to this, the model that Infantino is defending is the one of the, the, the Northern American close leagues. And that's, there's a real risk that uh, money from uh, external investors coming to football after this crisis to impose a very different model from, from a government's point of view, but also from a sporting point of view. So it's not, only, it's not only good ideas, it's not only people with good intentions that are at the moment thinking about the future of football. And I... I think as fan, as fan activists, as fan representatives, we have to be extremely careful about the terrible ideas that will be circulating around. Yeah, I could certainly agree with that. I could certainly agree with that. I'm sure there'll be questions about that too. So um, 
could we hand to the to the virtual floor for about 10 minutes of questions i i fully appreciate we won't be able to get through all of the questions today um it's one of the shortcomings of, of such a short session but we will return and pick up in the future again so could i invite some questions from the floor Yeah, can I ask one team? No one else is. Hi, Mark. Yeah, no, cheers, Pete. And cheers, uh, panel. It was really interesting. And um, I just want to pick up on what Ronan was saying there. I think football is going to change. It's whether it changes for the benefit of fans and players or for the benefit of global capitalists. Um, do we want to wait and see what happens or should we be at the forefront of actually challenging this? as putting forward the manifesto for what we should be doing as fans to try to remake football in a sort of more socially conscious or community orientated model rather than this global you know, capitalist model. Should we be at the forefront trying to push this forward? I suppose, how do we do that if that is the case? I'll, answer, I'll, I'll take that one, Pete, if I Yes, if I may. please, yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think we can be at the forefront of it. Um, I think what we as a, an organisation have to be cognizant of, though, is of course that we have a, a very diverse membership, and they will have differing views on uh, you know what are the ills of the game and whether you know um, global capitalism is a good or bad thing. So we, we have to be very very wary of that. But the things that we've done. Um, in the past um, few years, um, both as FSF and Supporters Direct and now as the FSA, is get very close to the ear of government by various different means. And that's not only um, the all-party parliamentary group for supporters, um, but with um, briefings with MPs on a regular basis. Um, we also appear in front of um, DCS, DCMS uh, select committees um, we have influenced even the Conservative Party uh, manifesto at the last election, um, whereby they have um, said that they will have a fan-led review of football. Um, so I think it's it's a it, you, it's it's all about influencing in different ways. Um, we you know we we um, as a uh, as a as a member organisation we we do have to take that care, but I think that um, if there are um, elements that uh, the com that there are elements of our membership that would understand that uh, the uh, the model isn't um, perhaps everybody's dream, um, and that some of the changes that we were, were talking myself and Nicola were both talking about earlier um, really should come to pass for the, the greater good going forward. But um, yeah, there are way ways and means that we can do it, but there's a there's a, a kind of subtlety to it rather than uh, you know just uh, completely grabbing the ball by the horns and saying it's all it's all terrible and uh, you know, and, and the like because obviously that's not not the case and obviously is not representative of all of our members views either so the response i think i could see oliver asking a question how do we yeah unmute? Just, oh, yeah, just, yeah Hi, oliver. Unmuted, um... Yeah, I mean, just, just to, I guess, to build on the other side of that, though, um, I mean, hi historically, times of great economic turmoil in football have been <laughs> kind of been good times for supporter ownership in terms of more clubs actually become potential, uh, I don't want to call them targets, but we, we, we welcome more of them into our family. Uh, so I wonder, as well as trying to kind of push um, for representation at the top table, how much can we realistically do? And by we, I mean, you know, the FSA and support um, SD Europe, and, but also like the, the community of fan-owned clubs that I'm a part of. How could, you know, is there a plan for, um, like, are you already starting to see stirrings of possibilities of clubs who might end up going into supporter ownership? I mean, whether they're going bankrupt and becoming Phoenix clubs or just simply, um, you know, fans trying to um, organize buyouts and take over. Um, what kind, you know, what can we do to make the most of this uh, and actually help more things go in our direction rather than in the, in the other direction from a kind of bottom up club by club um, approach? I should probably take that one as well, Pete. Um, yes is the answer to your question, um, Oliver, in as much as there are a number of people that are coming to us um, that are showing an interest and, you know, part of it is 
um, due to the crisis. Um, I can't reveal too many of, of those, obviously. Um, it's definitely an opportunity. I think, for example, we've seen um, Barrow raising £65,000 um, to retain their 10% stake in their club. Um, that's the Supporters Trust. Um, similar things happening at Hartlepool United. I, I, I would, would sort of err and uh, there's a degree of caution as well, because I think as um, Mark Palios wrote in The Guardian yesterday, um, saying that on the flip side of what you're saying, and absolutely we are proactively all the time looking at trying to promote the model of community ownership, because uh, we believe as an organisation that it's absolutely the, uh, um, the way forward at many, at many different levels. By the same token, we do have to be wary of rogue owners coming in at a time when clubs are potentially vulnerable. Um, we, can, we can see that you know, some, some clubs could be susceptible to those people you know, using the opportunity and this time to um, take advantage of it. And I, I think we, we, have to be, we have to be very cognizant of that as well. We really do have to be careful um, and make sure that, that um, you know, the and I think, and, and moving on from that, that the the lack of some regulation in that's, that's been clear to allow things like the very situation to happen should not be allowed to happen again. We must strengthen the regulation of the game to prevent rogue owners coming into uh, into it. And we we this is a, a good time, I think, to take stock of where we are and really understand um, how vulnerable potentially some of the clubs are. So we've had a couple of questions come up on the Zoom chat, uh, which I'll read through now. Um, so I suppose the first one by, by Sean, Sean Huddleston, um, relates to some of these issues and builds upon them, but, but what percentage of clubs are seriously under threat of, of bankruptcy and worse, and how likely is that to produce a, a, a reconstruction of the league system? I suppose it builds and connects on some of those issues. Um, yeah, anyone like to have a go at that one? Yeah, yeah go I can, on. I can jump in. Obviously, I'm not going to have a, an exact percentage for me no. to put on how many clubs are, are going to be in, in trouble because of this, uh, this situation. It is difficult to say. Um, but remember that before this crisis happened, we had a large percentage of clubs behind the scenes that were already looking for, looking, actively looking for new owners, actively... Uh, expressing difficulties uh, financially anyway um which I kind of just to kind of reiterate the points that richard makes shows that maybe the the system you know it hasn't been isn't ideal we can say it's not ideal when you see the likes of situations happening at, at bury and beyond um so i think you say this is an opportunity like we said to take stock i think there will be clubs that are in trouble because of the, the this crisis it just accentuates the trouble that they were already in mm. Precisely, yeah, I would agree uh, with that. Another question that's coming from uh, Giran Yako is how, sh how should clubs manage the relationships with fans that are in higher risk that may not be able to return to the ground in the near future? Who would yeah. like to have a go at this one? So it's about... Well, I can take that one. Yes, please, Ronan. Uh, it's, 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 an, it's a really good question, actually. Uh, from what I've seen about the public discussion in most countries, there hasn't been plans at the moment for parts of the fan base to be able to return and the, the, the high risk one uh, to be forced to stay at home. But I guess this discussion will come at some point. Um, the clubs are already struggling to, to keep the relation with their fans at the moment. And there's a lot, a lot of bad ideas as well. They're floating around, you know, making fake carton fans in the stands or some digital uh, image being, being, being uh, showcased on the stands to, to again, to bring fake fans during the games behind closed doors and basically turning a uh, turning, uh, health crisis into, um, into an event. So again, here, there's a lot, of, a lot of things floating around and a lot of terrible ideas and we're trying to, 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 to oppose this as much as possible. But when it comes to the high, the, the high risk population and the return to the game, I think we, what we will see is something similar to what's happening with accessibility in general. Clubs that are able to cater for every category of fans will come up with ideas, and and I'm sure Cafe, the the uh, European network for for accessibility and, and disabled fans, will come up with suggestions and proposals. But uh, that's that's minority of fans in Europe 
of the clubs or in Europe, and and a few countries are doing a lot better on that matter than than others. Spain, Germany, of good practice example. Russia is incre increasingly as well, and I can imagine specific stands for high risk fans. I will go about it until the state of the of the crisis management, and and I am not aware of any any plan. Uh, for for the return of uh, the high risk populations to the stadiums. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. And um, so Dan Parnell has put up a message on here. Just said that people in the room can also comment on the chat facility too to respond to questions. Um, I've got a question from Jonathan Irving. Jonathan, I've seen you on the top panel. Do you want to ask the question yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, got an interest in this. Point partly because I'm one of a number of people here who's involved with Banker 1876, fan-owned club playing in the fifth tier of local football. I'm interested in this notion that football, due to social distancing and so on, when it restarts, might restart from the grassroots up. So at a local level, games might be taking place before you've got the likes of the English Premiership restarting. Do you think that local fan-owned teams are going to need to do things differently if they're going to try to capitalize on that and encourage people to turn up to a local game who generally don't go along to that type of football but are happy to spend 50 60 80 quid a time going on a coach paying for an expensive ticket and all that to go and watch a big team in the english premier league for example shall i take that one please? yes please yeah, I think uh, it's, it, it would appear if, if, if that does does happen, and obviously we, we, we don't know um, whether that is even a remote possibility right at this moment. I think that there's a there's a real chance chance for smaller clubs to benefit, as you say, Jonathan, from um, the lack of activity at other levels. And um, I think yeah, it's, it it will take um, those clubs to be imaginative. I think um, obviously the social distancing and the like um I mentioned earlier more vulnerable people as well and i think it's a uh, some real challenges that all of our clubs will uh, will have but then yeah i think look at it potentially as an opportunity maybe those people that ordinarily do go on those coaches and pay 60 to 80 quid for a for a ticket um to a premier league game um, may consider looking at their uh, their local club i think once once a, Many of the, uh, the people on this call, I think, are, are fans of the non-league game. And uh, the minute that um, you, you go to a non-league club, I think, and the chance to get yourself involved and the like, um, it actually appeals to a lot of people. It doesn't appeal to everybody. But there's chances to get more people involved and to attract bigger crowds in the future, perhaps. So, yeah, I mean, if that came about, it, um, it would be a, a real opportunity uh, for those clubs. It's just really, really difficult to predict whether that will be something that, 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 that does happen. Great. So I think time's running out on us a little. So um, I just want to begin to, to, to wind up now by, um, by thanking all of the panellists for such a great debate. It was really a fantastic debate. So thanks to Ronan, to Nicola and to Richard. And um, also thanks to Deb Stillworth as well for playing such a leading role in organising this panel. She's been really helpful to this, Deb. So thank you. And um, before I end the contributions from the panellists, I'd just like to invite each of them to come back and tell us a little bit about how we can find out more about the organisations and potentially how we can join. So if we go with, um, if we go with Ronan first. Uh yeah, you can find it. You can find us uh, on our website, which uh, which is a bit outdated, and we take the opportunity of the crisis to to take the time to finally work on it. Uh, and on social media, and where you can you can you can happily join. Uh, we also have um, a network of of uh, fan researchers from uh, from around about thirteen or fourteen European countries. Where Mark, for example, in the call. Uh, is and you are you you and this call are, are welcome to to join as well. And um, just a concluding remark, I think as we're slowly moving moving from the from the time of crisis to to the time of when we can think of what what's what do we want for, for football globally in the future. Uh, I think 
that's the time when when everybody should should pitch in and try to contribute and when we need to have uh the best possible public discussion of what we want about football in the future and not let uh, jenny infantino's uh terrible ideas and hidden plans uh drive drive the narrative on the global level so i hope i hope the discussion we the quick discussion we had today uh we can prolong this and and that uh we can we can all together uh, uh think about what we want for for future for football out of this crisis in the future Great, thank you. A cautious message of hope. Um, from, from the FSA, would either Jonathan or Nicole like to give us the drill? Yeah, you can uh, You can find out everything you need to know about the FSA at our website, which is thefsa.org.uk. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at wearethefsa. Uh, we take on individual members as well as um, uh, groups. Uh, so feel free to join. Please join. The more the merrier. Um, together we are stronger and all of that. Um, if you are going to our website though, please stop, stop by our coronavirus FAQs page. It is jam-packed full of information for football fans on things like ticketing, travel, advice for our community-owned clubs, looking at how you can hold a supporters group meeting in this time of social distancing, um, talking about volunteering, resources for young fans. Debs in particular has put together some fantastic youth worksheets to keep young people uh, busy, engaged, but also teach them about supporter activism in these times. So check out our website. We've got quite a lot of resource on there for you to work through. Keep you busy. Superb. Thank you, Nicola. And thank you, Richard. Just for a last word, can I hand over to Dan uh, to talk about future and upcoming sessions? Yeah, just echo Pete's comments. Um, massive thank you to everyone involved who's, who's helped organise it. This is part of like our away from the numbers event. So it's about creating the activities for people to network. And we had loads of good intentions for activities all around the country before COVID kicked in. So it's, it's evolved in, and I'm very grateful for everyone involved and very thankful for Peter, who's been a stellar chair today. Um, obviously we scratched the surface today, so it just opens it up for future events. So we want to move forward with, with that open to suggestions, get in touch with Pete and maybe we can put him back in the chair again. Um, I'll do it again. Yes, yes. Uh, Sunday, we've got an event that Helena Burns organised. Um, looking at, we've got uh, Corinthian Nomad versus Dundalk Ladies, Ladies, 50 years on. Next Tuesday, we've got the Football and Lockdown Conference. And then shortly, we'll be announcing um, like a, a six part grassroots football uh, session that's going to run over the next uh, six weeks. So, yeah, really open to running something like this again. And thank you for everyone take, taking part. Peter, thank you so much. Thank Brilliant. you for not doing. Cheers, everyone. Thanks to everyone. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Cheers, everyone. Bye.